Good morning. I'd like to welcome you to our worship service this morning. Today is the transfiguration of our Lord. It's the day when our Lord goes up onto the mountain with uh, Peter, James, and John, and he is transformed before him. He visibly changes, revealing his glory. And uh, this shows that the old covenant, the old way of things, has passed. And now... Jesus is in, in, in encouraging us to embrace his new covenant with us, the covenant of the wonderful gospel message. We follow the order of the service that is presented for you in your service folder. Uh, we begin with our opening hymn, The King Shall Come. God's blessings to you on your worship this morning. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come in the presence of God who created us to love and to serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Let us pray. 
Lord God, before the suffering and death of your one and only Son, you revealed his glory on the holy mountain. Grant that we who bear his cross on earth may behold by faith the light of his heavenly glory and so be changed into his likeness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is taken from the 34th chapter of the Old Testament book of Exodus, beginning with the 29th verse. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not realize that the skin of his face was shining because he had been speaking with the Lord. When Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, they were amazed that the skin of his face was shining, so they were afraid to come close to him. Moses saw or called to them, so Aaron and all the rulers of the community returned to him, and Moses spoke to them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came close to him, and he gave them all the commands that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. When Moses was finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out again. Then he would come out and tell the people of Israel what he had been commanded. Whenever the people of Israel saw Moses' face, they would see that the skin of Moses' face was shining. Then Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with the Lord again. Here ends our first lesson. We continue with singing of our hymn, or, or excuse me, our psalm, psalm number two. Our second lesson this morning, which will also serve as our sermon text, is taken from the third and fourth chapters of Paul's letter, second letter to the church in Corinth. 
beginning with verse 12. Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. In spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains when the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it is taken away on only, it was taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. But all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This, too, is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since we have this ministry as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. On the contrary, we have renounced shameful, underhanded methods. We do not operate in, decent, in a deceitful way, and we do not distort the word of God. Instead, by proclaiming the truth clearly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Here ends our second lesson. Please rise. Hallelujah. A voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. Alleluia. Gospel for this transfiguration of our Lord is taken from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke, beginning with the 28th verse. And we read these words as follows in Jesus' name. About eight days after he said these words, Jesus took Peter, John, and James and went up to the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing became dazzling white. Just then, two men, Moses and Elijah, were talking with him. They appeared in glory and were take, talking about his departure, which he was going to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and those with him were weighed down with sleep, but when they were completely awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not realize what he was saying. And while he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them. They were afraid as they went into the cloud. Then a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I love. Listen to him. After the voice had spoken, they found Jesus alone. They kept this secret and told no one of those days any of the things they had seen. Here ends the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please be seated. We sing our next hymn, Down the Mount of Glory.
Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text this morning is our second lesson, the uh, 12th chapter, or excuse me, the, the third chapter of, of uh, 2 Corinthians, verses, uh, verse, starting, beginning with verse 12, which we read just moments ago. <clears throat> Dear friends, fellow redeemed in Jesus Christ are changed. Savior. If we're looking for a single thought that describes the emphasis of this Sunday, it's a reasonable choice that we would use the word change. This theme is reflected in all of our scripture lessons today. In our Old Testament reading, we see the change that came over Moses when he had been in the presence of God on Mount Sinai. We'll talk more about that in just a bit. In our gospel lesson, we see Jesus momentarily changed, or as we like to say, transfigured, from the normal state that his disciples were accustomed to seeing him, to the glorious state that was and is the, himself as the divine second person of the Trinity. Now through this event, the disciples were given a glimpse of the glory that awaits all who embrace Jesus in faith, including the modern day disciples like us. Change is also the theme of our second lesson and our text for today. This in this rather challenging section of 2 Corinthians, the essential point that Paul makes is that Jesus Christ is not the only one in whom change takes place. On Transfiguration Sunday, we certainly note how Jesus is changed, but so are those who know him. That's the thought that Paul drives home for us today. We'll spend the next several minutes exploring just what that means as we work our way through the, this interesting text, verse by verse. And then draw our observations and our applications that shine no less brightly for us than it did for Jesus on that mountain. So we begin. Therefore, since we have this kind of hope, we act with great boldness. So the words in, before this verse and continue through the text, Paul talks about the two great teachings of the Bible, the law and the gospel. He makes point that the gospel, teaching the, the teaching that, uh, that out of love Jesus has freely and completely saved us from the consequences that our sins deserve, is much more glorious than the law summarized in the Ten Commandments, which, we, which says that we are responsible for our salvation by keeping perfectly all of God's commands. Now, trying to be saved eternally by keeping the law perfectly or even partially brings despair because it simply can't be done by sinful human beings and in contrast, believing the gospel brings a sure hope, as our text points out, of everlasting life. The law says, do. The gospel says, done. It's a big difference. Our text continues, since we have this kind of hope, Paul says, we act with great boldness. Now, to be bold means to be confident in where we stand and unafraid of where we're going. And that's exactly what the gospel does. It makes us spiritually and emotionally bold, confident, unafraid, because Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive all of us our sins. 
we can boldly state that we will stand unaccused by God on the day of our death. On a day of our death. For Jesus himself said, whoever believes on the Son has everlasting life. But Moses goes on, excuse me, but Paul goes on to tell us that not everyone can say that. He says, we are not like Moses who put a veil over his face so that the Israelites could not continue to look at the end of the radiance as it was fading away. So this was the subject of, our, of today's first lesson. Let me give you the full context. So after Moses had broken the original tablets of stone upon which the Ten Commandments were written, when he came down from the mountain, you may remember he, was, he, he uh, broke them in anger because of, he saw the Israelites worshiping the golden calf. And the Lord then once again summoned him back up to the mountain and Moses returned to the Israelites with a second set of tablets. However, and unbeknownst to him, because Moses had been in the presence of God, his face was radiant. It glowed. In fact, it was illuminated to the point that at first the Israelites were scared to go near him. To remedy the situation, Moses puts a veil over his face. But he didn't always keep it on. He took it off whenever he told the Israelites the commands that the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. And by this practice, he was showing them the glory of the Lord. After he was finished talking to them, he put a veil back over his face. Now, as far as we know, Moses did not spend the rest of his life behind that veil. The shine from his face eventually faded. The significance that Paul takes away from this historical incident is that the radiance from Moses' face as he spoke about the law was a fading glory. And Paul says this is symbolic of the fact that the law of Moses spoke all also was only a fading glory. In other words, the law is not the final word of God. Its glory is passing. When the law had struck terror in people's consciences and then shows them their sinfulness and their inability to perform their way into heaven, well, then the law has done its work. And it can do no more. So therefore, its glory is temporary. It's necessary, but it's temporary. It was never intended to be a way of salvation. Its purpose is to show us our sins and our need for a Savior. The law drives us to the glories of the gospel. Paul continues, in spite of this, their minds were hardened. Yes, up to the present day, the same veil remains where the Old Testament is read. It has not been removed because it, takes away, it is taken away only in Christ. Instead, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So the Israelites in Paul's illustration failed to grasp the truth that the, law, uh, that the law's purpose is to lead them to greater glory, the greater glory of the gospel. They had been impressed by the glory of the law, and they have made it a means by which they thought that they could be saved, um, saved and save themselves eternally. In so doing, they veiled themselves from the truth. And that veil can only be lifted when one understands Christ. 
Even today, Paul says, when Moses is read, meaning the Old Testament books of the Bible where God laid down his various commands and decrees, and misunderstood by anyone to be a performance-based system to achieve rightness with God, or it, to have it to be a do-it-yourself manual for eternal salvation, well, then a veil covers their hearts, which keeps Christ from entering. However, whenever anyone turns to Jesus Christ, the, that oppressive veil is of the law as a means of salvation is lifted. It's not there anymore. Paul says, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So when the Holy Spirit brings us to understand the gospel, the result is freedom. Freedom from the law as an impossible way of salvation. And because salvation is a gift through Jesus Christ, freedom to serve the Lord joyfully, willingly, and without compulsion. This can't happen without the Holy Spirit. And this can't help but give us a, the, a, the, this effect on us, which Paul now mentions here too. He says, but all of us who reflect the Lord's glory with an unveiled face are being transformed into his own image from one degree of glory to another. This too is from the Lord who is the Spirit. So the result of knowing Jesus as our Savior is that we, out of love for him, change. We grow in our life as Christians. We work on our sanctification through the power of the Holy Spirit. Meaning that we do his will more and more in grateful appreciation for what he has done for us. As growing grateful Christians, we become more and more like our master and grow more and more Christ-like in our actions and in our attitudes. Now, it doesn't happen all at once. And we will have setbacks along the way, to be sure. Because the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh don't yield that easily. But we have a new trajectory. And as we stay close to Christ, this transformation will go on until the day that we see him face to face in heaven. And there, we will be completely changed. The Apostle John tells us that when we are in heaven, we will be just like him, perfect in every way. So Paul wraps everything up as he told us and draws a conclusion as it pertains to his ministry and on a broader level how it pertains to every single Christian. He says, therefore, since we have this ministry, and I guess we could say that maybe a better, better way to understand that word ministry is this understanding. So therefore, since we have this understanding, as a result of the mercy shown us, we are not discouraged. In the time that we have left, let's zero in on three specific areas that Paul talks about. Three specific areas where the gospel changes us and transforms us. First, the gospel makes us very bold. It states that boldness, meaning being confident of... Uh, are, are, Excuse me, I stated earlier that the boldness means being confident where and uh, where we stand and unafraid of where we're going. So where do where then um, where then do we where then do we stand? We stand in the in the grace of God. We stand as God's children. Reclaimed by Jesus Christ. 
redeemed by Jesus Christ. Along with that comes the boldness of knowing our Lord will never leave us or forsake us. The boldness of knowing that he has called us by name and we are his. The boldness of knowing not a single hair falls from our head without our heavenly Father's permission and oversight. The boldness of being able to approach the throne of grace and communicate directly with none other than the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Such is the boldness that is ours in this life. And such boldness continues on in our death. We know where we're going. Not because we've never sinned, but because we have always, and, and, and excuse me, not because that we've been some kind of paragon of virtue, but only because of Christ, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. The second verse of the beloved hymn, Jesus, Thy Blood and Righteousness, comes to mind. Bold shall I stand on that great day which can a word against me say. Fully through, your, uh, through you absolved I am from sin and fear, from guilt and shame. Secondly, Paul talks about Freedom. Jesus once said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Jesus is that truth, and knowing him gives us freedom. Freedom from worry, freedom from fear, freedom from the fear of the future, freedom from the fear that our lives will somehow be unimportant or insignificant. But most importantly, as Paul points out in today's text, freedom from the law of as a way of salvation. The psalmist says in Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? In other words, if our salvation depended completely on us being sinless beings, God, as God asks us to be, we would have zero chance of entering into eternal life. But then the psalmist answers his own question. But with you, there is forgiveness, therefore you are to be feared. And again, this word feared translates into the idea of respect, revered, loved. And that forgiveness is wrapped all up in the person of Jesus Christ. And because we have him in our lives, the third thing that Paul says, we are not discouraged. Or in other translations, we are not to lose heart. Paul tells us that the gospel message brings that about. And, and, and we need to hear that because it's easy to lose heart today. Despite all of the modern conveniences, all of the technology that we have, we still experience sickness and pain. We still experience loss and loneliness. We still feel discouragement and disappointment. Sure, there are days when we know great joy, but there are also days when we know great sorrow. There are days when we are rejuvenated and full of optimism. But there are days when we feel like throwing in the towel. Yes, there are those days, but there, is, there are no days when Jesus is not present in our life, guiding, directing, overseeing, there are no days which wipe out what Jesus has done for us on Calvary. There are no days when Jesus withdraws his promise to us that he will always be there. 
And when we focus on that, like Paul, who has his shares of ups and downs throughout his life, we are not discouraged. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was changed. He wasn't the only one. Knowing him changes us. Because of him, we are bold, free, encouraged, and saved. Liberated to go forward through life, rejoicing in our transformation from sinners to saints. Happily compelled each day to reflect it on our faces, in our lives, and in our attitudes. Reflect that change that the Spirit has worked within us as we look forward to the day when that glory will be revealed to us in the fall. Praise be to him now and forever. Amen. Please rise. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. His peace be with you. Amen. We continue on page 10 with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We bring forward our offering. We give thee but thine own, whate'er the gifts may be. All that we have is thine alone, a trust, O Lord, from thee. May we thy bounties thus as stewards to receive, and gladly, as thou blessest us, to thee our first fruits give. Amen. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies you show us. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank you for those who teach and preach your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick. Cheer those who are sad. Calm those who are distressed. And comfort all who are old and infirm. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our, governments, our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we know that the events of this world are in your hands. 
and that you are always working out all things for the good of your people. We pray that you would watch over and protect those who minister on your behalf. May you also especially watch over those who may be injured in this Ukrainian conflict, those who may be taken prisoner and comfort the families of those who perish. Use these events for your glory and to move your people to prayer and acts of conscience, uh, compassion. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies, our minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. We sing our next hymn, How Good Lord to Be Here. rise for prayer. Almighty God, we thank you for teaching us the things that you want us to believe and do. Help us by your Holy Spirit to keep your word in pure hearts, that we may be strengthened in faith, guided in holiness, and comforted in life and in death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. We continue with our final hymn, How Great Thou Art.
Lord. of announcements. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, announce that uh, we are starting our youth group this evening, uh, youth group meetings, that is, and it will be every uh, last Sunday of the month. Um, so each Sunday of the month, we'll have another, another meeting. Um, this, uh, this week or today, it will be uh, our first one, and it will be a skating and dance party at our school this evening from 6 until 7.30. Bring your skates, your hoverboards, or whatever it is you want to roll around on. Uh, maybe just your dancing feet. We'd like to see all of our kids have some fun and, and build some lasting relationships with each other. And we hope that, uh, that you'll, you'll, we'll, we'll see you there. This morning after our Bible study we will, and Sunday school, we will have our deacons meeting um, at 11.30 today. Um, today is also our, our uh, noisy collection. Uh, if you'd like to give to that, it's out there on the little table in the narthex. 
For the month of March, Hand to Hand is asking us to collect pepperoni and fruit snacks, um, and you can leave those items under the table in the narthex. We are currently um, holding a silent auction. The Ever Ready Circle uh, does this every year. Um, and uh, we, uh, we started actually on Thursday, uh, but we'll be continuing it through March 6th. So you have uh, this Sunday and next Sunday uh, to peruse all the items that are located in our fellowship hall and maybe make some, uh, make some um, bids on things and so on. There's lots of stuff in there. Um, go and have a look. Uh, we will be starting our midweek services uh, for our Lenten series this year entitled Crucial Hours, focused on the two days uh, that we really say focus on Jesus' passion. That is Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. Um, but we'll be looking at those two days in particular throughout our Lenten season this, week, this year. And uh, Ash Wednesday, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be celebrating Ash Wednesday this year on Thursday, uh, this coming Thursday evening. And we'll continue to have it, our, our, ad, or, or, excuse me, our Lenten services um, on Thursday evenings. Uh, not, this, not this Thursday, but the following Thursday, we will be having a taco supper um, here in the fellowship hall at 5.30. Um, um, that uh, if you'd like any more information on that, I know that there's some sign-up sheets. I don't know, those are sign-up sheets? Well, I'm not quite sure what those, those are. But anyway, you can take a look at there. There's two uh, announcements on either side of the church as you leave. Um, and uh, if you have any, any questions about it, give, uh, uh, talk to my wife. And the Everybody Circle will also hold a chili cook-off and family game night on Friday, March 18th in the social hall at 6 o'clock. Uh, Sign-up sheets is in the narthex. Um, uh, it'll be a fun time. Hopefully you all are able to make it that, that evening. Uh, we'd love to see you there. I believe those are all of my announcements. Oh, yes, and uh, no, I always forget. Uh, there are those sign-up sheets in the, uh, in the, under the mailboxes. We really could use some help on various things throughout our church. Uh, uh, sign up for ushering and, and greeting and, and other items, that, uh, other things that we need our church uh, to do. As, our, uh, as, as Christians, we want to support the work of our Lord, and I encourage each of you to take a look at those lists and see... Um, See what you can do uh, for your Lord. Anything else? Then, at this time, we'll let our Sunday school children and teachers go first. And until we meet again, may God's blessings be with all of you.